Thank you very much. We have about 40 uh, minutes for discussion or shorter. After discussion, well, there will be drinks, which will be free. <laughs> and uh, okay, what is the first question? Maybe answer. That's what you usually do, you say, ah, maybe I said it. Okay. okay. So maybe I said the question, and the, my question is, if we talk so much about Europe, in pubs, in, uh, about Greece, um, about things that, that it's the first time that we are acting as a family maybe, why is it, and you mentioned that, that uh, conservatism, extremism, anti-Europe sentiments were there before the crisis, why is it that they increase so much? For example, in this country, we have probably to deal with two phenomena. One, there will be a record low participation in the upcoming European election. And the party, or the parties who are explicitly against Europe, who want to get out of Europe, who want to uh, introduce border controls, who want to take down the European flag, are eventually going to be the strong parties. How, how do you explain it? What, 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 what is, is that Kafka again, or something worse? Oh, OK. Well. Uh, it's very difficult to read what it means when people don't. Okay, so it's very difficult to read what it means when people don't come to to uh, to two elections. You can mean that they, that they don't care. This is obviously how one must read it. But the question is, do they not care because they are too happy, or because they're too angry? And from, from the analysis that you gave me is that the people who, um, who actually care are the ones who are, who are angry rather than the majority who, does, who can't even be bothered. So, but of course, I mean, this is no excuse for, for, these, for, these, for these European, um, European uh, for, for, the, for the low uh, appearance in, in, in European elections. Well, I, I also think that the problem is that we don't really have, you know, sort of European force, uh, no, European parties. This is, it's still a national, uh, a national, national elections. Because you can theoretically vote for anybody in Europe. You can vote for a Czech somebody, uh, but nobody does that. And that, again, to me, it's like if the Texas people would only be voting for Texas, Texas presidents that come from Texas and that. So that, to me, is still sort of a birthing pain of, um, of this new entity, which would be called, which would be called Europe. Um, uh, and why are people nationalistic? Again, I mean, to me, in, in some countries it goes up, and in some countries it goes down. This is the one great idea, I think, again, of European integration. It happens from time to time that a country goes astray uh, politically, it elects a government that, historically speaking, they will be sorry for. Let's define, let's define it in that way. And economically, always one, two country in Europe go into some sort of a little bit more extreme nationalism or they go bankrupt. Something happens, uh, but it never happens to the 28 countries at the same time. So even though you have a couple of countries bankrupt, the rest of the countries can help them. Even though you have countries with, 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 let's say, nationalist leaders, like you have a little bit, the worst we have in Europe, which actually isn't all that bad, is Hungary. You know, but if Hungary is the worst we have, we're still doing pretty well. And what happens usually with these nationalists is that they do get, sometimes, elected into the parliament, but they almost never end up in government because their coalition potential, this is what happened in Hungary, right um, uh, a couple of weeks back with, with Jobbik, which was also a nationalist party. They won, uh, sorry, they, may, they, they got significant um, number of seats in the parliament. Same thing happened to True Finns, same thing happened to the Golden Dawn in, in, um, in Greece. Made it to the parliament, never made it to the government. It's very rare that an extremist party makes it to the government. And what it does, the other European countries exercise whatever power they have, which isn't much, 
but they still do a little bit, to try to stop them. You could see this nicely with Orban, who tried to, tried to have more political influence over their national bank. And there was this soft pressure from all other European countries that in one way really sort of made it very difficult for him um, to do that and effectively prevented him from uh, exerting influence over, uh, over um, independence of their, of their national banks. Next to that, I of course don't have any, nobody has recipe against, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, I would just call it stupidity. I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, this will always be the case. The hope of democracies is that this stupidity will not prevail. Okay, there's a question up here. Yes, um, I have to say something to make my point clear, I guess. Um, if you go to a village very close to Metz in France, that's where Robert Schumann was living and he died, and it's a museum now. And something Schumann was very active on uh, in his time was not just Europe as an economic force, but was U Europe, what it could mean uh, for individual and social identity. And what you do very well in your story is say that Europe has got stuck in nationalism. And one of the things we never solved in Europe, and which the Americans did, they created the US yeah, as, yeah. An, as a national identity, we never got to that point in Europe. So we never got rid of identity in terms of individual and, and societal identity. And this was replaced by what you say, Europe and economical identity. So we stopped thinking in terms of nationalism in some way, and we replace that by identity as being a consumer or yeah. an entrepreneur yes. or a businessman Perfect. or a leader. Perfect. And that's all we are. If we are not a leader or a consumer, we are nothing in this time. So the challenge we have is to find new personal and social uh, identities. And the trouble is that Europe is not a metaphor that, that fuels the new thinking on, on identity. And I think if we talk about evolution or revolution of Europe, this is the challenge we have to find new social identities that are related to, uh, to the concept of Europe. Yeah. And if we go back to, the, to, to uh, Schumann and, and the people at the time of the, found, the founding fathers of Europe, this idea of the cultural identity of Europe was there. And we don't have to go back, I think, I need, think we need to go forward in terms of thinking of who are we in Europe and reinvent a new social identity. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's, that's really a brilliant point. And I could even maybe, if you allow me, I could even add to it. I, I'm occasionally, uh, I'm developing now this question that I'm asking myself about economic ethics. It looks like we're not doing anything bad. We're just being technically, you know, mathematically allocative of scarce resources. But what in fact is happening is we're redefining the identity of man. Economic anthropology. So, so for example, okay, I don't know if you have this in this country as well, but in my country, it's very fashionable to ask economists about corruption, and we come up with calculations that corruption is actually bad for the economy. To which I always say, okay, well, what if we, by chance, discovered that corruption is good for the economy? I mean, you can argue this. You know, corruption makes the economy go faster. You don't have to wait in a queue, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, uh, so what if we found out economically that corruption is actually good for the country? It isn't. We live in a w w world where saying that stealing is bad isn't enough. That is an argument that doesn't excite anybody. We need to add to it an economic logic. In other words... The values of past, whatever they are, are surviving only if they find for themselves economic justification. Take an example of art. This is very common in this country as well. It's very common in, 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 in Brussels and in other. The economic value of art. And now you have so many studies that show that if you support art, this will add 0.7% of GDP to Again, my point is, well, what if that study discovers that supporting art actually slows down the economy? Which, to me, what art is supposed to do. 
art is not supposed to be increasing our you know, productivity for us to make work better and easier. No, art is there for you to so mingle. Stop, you're not a production unit. Just imagine how our lives would look like without art. We would be looking forward to working on Monday morning. <laughs> We would all have the same clothes and we would all like the, the horse boxer in Animal Farm from George Orwell says, I will work harder and better. That's how we would be without art because art tells us this is how, this is how uh, Oscar Wilde um, ends his very famous introduction in the picture of Dorian Gray. He ends the introduction with saying, all art is quite useless. And he doesn't mean uh, useless as in it should be thrown away, but that it is one of the few areas in our lives that are exempt from this economic dictate of increasing utility. Art, in my view, philosophy, is exempt from having to be useful. It can be <coughs> unuseful. Now, uh, the question is, again, I call this subject-object reversal. So that's a little bit more sort of on a philosophical note. But today, I'm not a philosopher. Today, I'm, I'm uh, an economist. Um, you find this very often in the history of culture that the, the, the ends, I talked about it a little bit when peace and economics, the ends and the means, or subject-object reversal, that uh, we often confuse the two. Are we working in order so that we can rest? Or are we resting in order so that we can work better? So take, for example, this is my favorite example. The fourth commandment, as a, a random example of a, of a value that was very highly valued in the ages past. The fourth commandment, so you know that the Ten Commandments are divided into two parts. The first three are sort of theological commandments. You will love your God. You will not make a graven image, and etc. And then the seven remaining commandments are sort of practical um, inter-human being commandments. Do you know which is the fourth commandment? In other words, the first practical commandment. Is this something also nobody, nobody knew? Exactly. Oh, huh, Gu said that? Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> The fourth commandment, the first real commandment, is the commandment of Shabbat. You will rest one day, and that's Saturday, and you will not work, nor you, nor anybody around you should do any work. So, today, we also rest, but the only reason why we rest is that somebody calculated that a rested human being is actually more efficient than a tired one. So, in other words... Resting is today a subset of economic, increasing economic efficiency. We don't rest because the work is done. We rest so that we can work better Monday. So, you know, likewise, again, from, uh, from Genesis, you know, it's not that God had another universe to start working on Monday morning and he needed to rest because his hands were tired. He rested because he was done which is another word that we really don't have in today's world, is this word done. I met this friend of mine, and when I was in meeting him, I asked him, like people do, so, you know, what's your name, blah, 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 and what do you do? I asked him, and he said, nothing, I'm done. <laughs> which to me is, was a great source of inspiration, and it also works quite well in, 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 in macroeconomics, because you know that in the beginning, the way economics started as a classical science was asking the question, how will the, soci sorry, how will the society look like when we are done? In other words, when the society is stationary, when, we have, uh, when the economy converges to a stationary point. This is a question that all the classical economists, all the way, let's say, to Keynes in his macroeconomic, sorry, economic possibilities, for our grandchildren, ask this question, what will happen when the economy will be, will be stationary? Uh, will it be a just society or will it be an unjust society? Some economists, the dismal science economists, like, such as Malthus and Ricardo in a way, most significantly and infamously Marx, believe that once the economy converges to a steady state, it will be a very unfair society with few rich people and a vast legion of proletariat, of, 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 of poor people, and there is no economic mechanism to cure that. 
That's why he called for revolution. There were other economists who believed, like Schumpeter, for example, who believed that, no, wealth will converge and the stationary state will be a happy state of mankind. What happened today is nobody talks about this anymore. The only way we talk about is GDP growth, maximum two years of outlook. But where we're going, we don't know. But we make up for this ignorance by speeding up. So we're not sure where we're going, but let's get there as fast as we can. <laughs> so anyway, so that, any, that only strengthens, I, I think, strengthens your point, which is that today's values are filtered through the filter of economic value. If you have a value that is not economically beneficial, we discard it. Even if you look at the program of Christian democratic parties, they talk about family values, but they talk about family values only because the pension system. So in other words, if the family as a value would crumble down, that would bring us an economic trouble of unsustainable pension scheme or whatever. And that's why we should have family as a high value, because it's, it makes economic sense. So we are here very often confusing the, me the ends with the means. Oh, health care. You know, we should invest money in health care because a healthy population uh, is cheaper. Well, again, I mean, I, I always thought that, you know, health is the, the aim. That's why we have economics, so that we can be healthy, not the other way around. So, um, so this really is, I would say, methodology. That's why I call economics a religion or a belief system, because it smuggles in values that are not questioned. That's why I sometimes call the markets uh, an unorchestrated orchestrator. You are not allowed to orchestrate it. Laissez faire, laissez passer, do not meddle. It will orchestrate you. It will tell you what to do in your life. It will give you values. It will tell you that being egoistic is okay. It will tell you that whatever you do as evil as possible will be turned automatically into public good, which is exactly the opposite to what St. Paul says in the Epistle of Romans. He says, I want to do good, but I end up doing evil. The invisible hand of the market does exactly the same, the opposite thing. I want to do evil, but damn it, I did it again. It became public good. <laughs> you know. um, so, um, uh, so the unorchestrated orchestrator becomes, becomes something that... Um, what are the economic values? What are the, what's the economic ethic? Well, uh, rationality. You don't find anything about emotions in your textbooks, so you ignore them. Uh, we only focus on values that can be calculated, which again is a, is, is, is a huge mistake. And uh, we know that being egoistic is okay. And most importantly, the economics has become a carrier of this belief that you live here to increase your utility. That's the whole exercise you've been doing for the first three years in your, in your microeconomics is increase uh, utility all the way till you hit your budget constraint. But if there would be no budget constraint, I mean, the, the, why, the role of a human being here, as you said, is to increase utility, which is a new philosophy, it's new ethics. In one way, you can, of course, trace where it came from, but it's definitely an ethical school, which, again, you can, you can disagree, you can, you, can, you, can, um, you can quarrel about. The problem with economics is that we... <coughs> You will say, no, these are assumptions. If these would be assumptions, I would not say a word. The way we do this in economics is like this. In the morning, we meet in an economic laboratory, whatever that means, but you know, there's always an economic laboratory somewhere. And two economists meet and they say, okay, let's, what shall we do today? Well, we are economists, so let's, do a, let's make a model. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, let's, let's then start with assumptions. Okay, well, what shall we assume today? <laughs> let's assume that people like yellow ice cream. Ah, uh, no, that's not a very good assumption. So let's assume that people like to wake up and jump on their left legs for two hours. No, not a... Let's assume that people are rational. That sounds rational. <laughs> so we take it as... as I'm, I'm, of course, I'm making... I'm joking a little bit here, but at the end of the day, I'm quite serious. The level of this assumption that human beings are rational is the same like saying human beings like yellow ice cream. It's an assumption, which is okay. As long as it remains an assumption, it's fine. Like in the physics laboratory, 
you assume that there is no friction of air when you want to calculate the free fall of an object. Which is a very, very, very useful assumption as long as you know it's an assumption. So, so far, there is not a problem. I'm happy I can sleep. The problem is when this economist then in the evening goes to a pub, meets his friends and says, you know what we discovered today? We discovered that human beings are rational. That's where the mistake, in the morning it was a technical assumption and in the evening it's an article of faith. And you will find majority of economists arguing that our assumptions are in fact a good description of reality. It's like if this physicist would come to a pub in the evening and say, you know what we discovered today? We discovered that friction of air doesn't exist. No, it's an assumption. We assumed it exactly because it isn't true. That's why we assume it. So that's where we as economists, we created this myth. It was a useful myth, maybe for the... Also mark that all these assumptions are there only so that we can calculate it better. Otherwise, they're useless. So in the beginning, it was an assumption of technical nature. In the evening, it becomes an article of faith over which you're ready to quarrel. I mean, you will find many economists quarreling with philosophers that you know, human beings actually are rational. So anyway, that's how far, that's how far this belief called economics could go. Yeah. Oh, Wait sorry. Wait a moment, there's a microphone on the way. So why do these assumptions still exist then? Why are they not broken? Well, why do people believe in UFOs and why do people believe in God? <laughs> it's a belief and it's okay. I have, economists should be treated like any religious minority. <laughs> they should have the right to believe whatever they choose to believe. They should have the right to say this openly and they should have the right to meet. But otherwise, you know, you always, when you talk with a, with, with, with a radical Believer, you sort of listen, but then you go, okay. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I'm joking a little bit, but, but in fact, it's, it's a belief system. And it's fine as long as we consider it to be a belief system. Okay, yeah. Hi. Um, what, in, uh, to what realms do we lean to if we have to leave economics? Say so what? Say so what? So what? You were talking about you had a critique towards the BNP and our nationalism and our the whole economics, but within Europe, what should we focus on oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. to make it sellable as well? Well, I think, for example, our other values, so of course, I have nothing against uh, economics. I'm an economist and I love it. It's like a lot of people think when I'm critical towards economics, which you can see that I slightly am, um, it's like when you have a literature critique. You know, you don't expect that critique to hate literature. And that's my position as well. I'm, I'm a literature critique. I love literature, and that's why I'm critical towards it. That's why I do these things with economics. What, so if I can rephrase your question, are you asking me what could substitute the fetish of, of economics? Yeah. Okay. So, for example, as I, as I sort of hinted in the beginning, nobody understands why, why we Europeans were so fascinated by this national fetishism of national growth. It's a laughing matter to us, luckily. When I talk about it, people laugh and can't really imagine killing each other for it. Maybe this is the same way our children will laugh about GDP growth. We don't know. It's a very serious topic to us. We're ready to sort of dismantle 50 years of efforts because a small little fracture there. But maybe two generations or one generation down the line, it will be, yeah, those, you know. So what will it, what will it be substituted by? Well. This is something that actually Keynes, I think I would rely here on him, answers in, um, in this Economic Possibilities of Grandchildren, where he says that economists, once we will, become, we will end in this stationary state, which he said, not in my lifetime, but in the lifetime of my grandchildren, around 100 years from now, which would be, I think, 10 years or 15 years from today. He wrote this in, in, in late 30s. We will no longer have this economic fetish Economists will cease to be priests, and the building will be built, um, and economists will be, become maintenance personnel. No longer dictating the structure, but really just making sure that when there is a leakage, they, 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 they clean it. So to answer your question, art, uh, 
interpersonal values, such as friendship. I mean, I don't want to be too hippie here, but, uh, but something along those lines. Yeah? Uh, there's, there, is, there is many values, and again, I'm not against growth. I think growth is a wonderful thing, and we should be grateful when it happens, but the problem is that we became, we became addicted to it. You will notice that our society is built on the assumption that GDP growth. If it doesn't grow, our pension system doesn't work. If GDP growth doesn't grow, our healthcare crumbles and, and many other things. It's, a, it's an assumption that I think is too strong. Uh, the economy grows, but not all the time. And the mistake there is, again, the subject-object reversal. I believe that market democracy or the system under which we live, I, I will call it market democracy, for lack of a better word, is the most fertile ground for GDP growth. But that having said, I think effectively we believe the reversal. We believe today, judging from the newspapers that I read and the, and, and the politicians and the economists that I hear, we believe today that growth is a conditio sine qua non of market democracy. And that to me is a very dangerous belief. Because why? Because in in, in this first belief, market democracy, the most fertile ground, much better than any other system, it is for, 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 for growth. If it happens, thank God, if it doesn't happen, the system still stands. So I'm a bigger believer in markets and I'm a bigger believer in democracy than my friends who are pro-growth because they need growth in order for this system to be sustained, while I don't. So my question is, I'm coming from Czechos former Czechoslovakia, the difficult question is, if communism would be giving an average Czech 6% GDP growth every year, would communism ever end? In other words, this is the Chinese debate. The debate which was quite strong two years ago. A lot of business people would come to me and say, look at China. They don't have democracy, but they grow. They have really very little worker protection. They have no, no public, civil society before we even get through the paperwork in China, the airport is already standing. We should really inspire, but this is true. We should really inspire, well, this is the case of the, um, the new Heathrow terminal in London. You know the story. Before we got through the paperwork of saving the last worm that needed to be transported in a special helicopter so that it wouldn't go extinct in China, they were already flying and there was a fountain on the airplane. I mean, on, on the, on the, um, uh, uh, the thing where they land. <laughs> Airfield. Uh, Airport. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the debate was, well, maybe, maybe we should sacrifice a little bit of our democracy in order to get faster GDP growth. And my question is, well, really? Is that what you want? You want to live in a less democratic country so that you can have two inches wider flat screens? So, so that is the question to me. I mean, would we as Czechs be ready to go into the streets and sacrifice freedom of speech, the freedom of movement, everything? A couple of prisoners get shot every year, but the economy is growing. <laughs> so that to me is exactly the dangerous moment of this subject-object reversal. Growth is an important thing. To me, it's a priority number, I don't know, seven. We make it look like GDP growth is the biggest worry that we have on the planet called Earth. There are other important things, just, and I mean, of course, you can substitute whatever you want there. So I just don't want to come out sounding like somebody who's against growth. No, I am very much for it. We should try all we can to, to make it, but not sacrifice the higher values in order so that we get the means done. So I, I think I even answered the question a little bit. Okay, there's a question up there, center. Yes, thank you. Um, as a student in economics, uh, I recognize your characterization of what I would call a mainstream economic, uh, economic paradigm. And um, I also miss certain courses in economics that give a different perspective on this study. And my question is actually, what do you think, uh, where does um, this, this cycle of reinforcing um, 
the mainstream economics break? Is it the role of the university to give a new insight or give different perspectives? Or is it the role of the students themselves? Or yeah. where does this change? So this, this, is, a, this is a very good question. Uh, okay, again, it's already late in the evening, so I'm going to be a little bit more relaxed. I have a very boring and, and, and technical answer in my book. So... Um, uh, Buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but a funny answer is, li it's a little bit like uh, Catholicism and Protestant revolution. So, I mean, we as mankind for thousands of years believed that there is only one way how to be a Christian or an economist, and that was to be a Catholic Christian. It was, I mean, Catholic equals Christian. And then somebody came up with this idea that there is a different way of believing, and maybe you don't need the priest and all that, you know this. The Netherlands, this is well known. By the way, thank you. All our liberal thinkers that would be otherwise killed in the Czech Republic, or not all of them, but many of them ran to, to your beautiful Netherlands. Comenius was, uh, was one of them. But um, 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 what we do is, and again, I'm going to be a little bit funny, but also a little bit serious. What we do this, I don't know how it is at your university, but judging from the universities that I have the experience with, for the first three years, we teach our students Catholic mainstream economic belief. And when the faith of these neophytes is strong enough, we tell them about other religions. But that's just a curiosity. <laughs> you know? So, of course, the right true thing to believe is this Catholic Christianity. And then, okay, look, there's Buddhism, there's Taoism, there's atheism, there's all other sort of uh, belief systems that we have. Um, what should we do? Well, we should do it like, we, like all other humanities teach. Their subject is first two, three years. They focus on the history of the field. Why? To know the dates? No. To know that 100 years ago, sociologists believed something that's complete baloney today. 60 years ago, anthropology, my, one of my favorite fields in humanities, was really racist. They were measuring the circumstance of a skull to show that this person is a human being and that person, sorry, two centimeters off, is an animal. <laughs> this was anthrop You could actually write a thesis in showing that some races are superior to other races and you would get a really good grade. Um, and that's anthropology, a beautiful science. Why do we teach this? Because we believed Everybody, including the professors and including everybody, believed that, that races actually... This was, this was irony, because this happened, by the way, in the time where we tried to look for similarities between human beings and animals. A human being or an ape, that's really very similar. But a blonde and a dark-skinned person, no. <laughs> you know, it's... it's, it's, it's from today's perspective, what were we smoking those days? <laughs> but it was a very firm belief. So the reason why in philosophy, in sociology, in law, in history, in anthropology, in all in media studies, in political studies, all other humanities, we make sure that the student understands that we are most likely wrong today as we were wrong 100 years ago. In other words, you should have a little arm's length from the mythology that they teach you, the, the newest think in economics uh, is nice, but 20 years down the line, we will know that things are a little different. I'm afraid that we don't do this in my university to our students. We first teach them the truth, and then we teach them how we got to it. That is absolutely illicit. It's like taking a student of philosophy, telling him the most recent, I don't know, Sloterdijk or Zizek, and telling him this is, this is real philosophy, all the things we had before was just waste to Zizek or Sloterdijk or, or Habermas or whoever. While I have nothing against these three geniuses, you need to know that while reading them, this is just one of possible ways of approaching. So just talk about philosophy. There was also a time in philosophy where analytical philosophy, so mathematics or logics, Logic was very predominant, it was the mainstream philosophy. And then came Kierkegaard and, and Nietzsche and others who came up with this existentialism in one way. Showing that, well, you know, while we respect analytic philosophy of proving that certain logical and, and Wittgenstein and, and all these things, it's, it's fine, this is not the whole of philosophy because people are also interested about 
the real things that are concerning in the rest. So maybe we see a little bit of this, maybe, in economics as well. There's some economists like Derda McCloskey, who I met here in Netherlands, actually, in, uh, in, in Amsterdam three months ago. She calls this humanomics. So that's my point. We should really, this is also, oh, sorry, for last sentence. Of all the humanities, we economists believe most in the freedom of choice. Yet we give our students no freedom of choice when it comes to the choice of their school. Yeah, 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 you can believe whatever, but calculate three years the utility maximizing theorem, and then we talk. So anyway, that's just... Uh, the final question is up there. Yes, uh, so you criticize focusing on GDP growth and uh, you also say that measuring GDP growth nationwide need, uh, leads to a researching nationalism in Europe. So my assumption is that uh, you are uh, in favor of a Europe of regions. And, but in Europe today, uh, regions that wish to have more autonomy, like for example Catalonia, they're not uh, dismissed into independence because Countries like Spain fear the unorchestrated orchestrators, as you said, the markets. And um, so my question is, uh, for you, what are the means you find most feasible uh, to reach long -term, a long-term focus on culture, uh, on art and friendship? Do you think that uh, maybe euro bonds, do you think that other measures to try to orchestrate the markets um, are necessary? That's a very, that's a very, <clears throat> very, very good question. It's funny, people usually say it's a very good question when they don't have an answer, you know. <laughs> but, uh, um, no, I mean, I, I think you a little bit uh, also hinted the suggestion, and yes, I believe that, you know, you, this is, we live in a time when the role of a national state, not of a nation, but a national state is withering. And it's not only withering upwards, it's also withering downwards. So I would... In my ideal world, it would be Switzerland-like direct democracies where you decide whether that table should be green or yellow. Uh, and you decide the regional issues yourself. Nobody should meddle in that. But then there are issues that you cannot effectively decide on the level of region, nor can you decide them on the level of nation. For example, ecology. I mean, you here in Netherlands can be 100% ecological, not emitting one single CEO into the air. I mean, CEO. CO2. <laughs> <laughs> no more CEOs. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, not emitting one more CO2 <laughs> into, into the atmosphere. This will serve you nothing because you still have your neighbors. And as long as the winds will be blowing, uh, your effort will be very highly appreciated, but you will lose your competitive advantage because producing things will be more expensive here, and you will not really be breathing that much cleaner air because... So, clearly, these things need to be decided at least on the European level, if not on the, on the global level. There's a very interesting book by Michio Kaku. I don't know if you, anybody of you is interested in theoretical physics. <laughs> so you know Michio Kaku. Yeah, okay, so he, he, he's, he's... I find him actually quite, quite interesting as a futurologist. He talks about how how certain inventions of energy need a certain uh, region of people. So, for example, to produce a car, you need a nation. You can't produce cars in a region because, I mean, you need a big nation too. Uh, in order to produce, I don't know, you, you, we now are capable of producing more advanced energy, uh, energies but we are not yet coordinated politically enough to, uh, to regulate them. So in other words, atomic bomb is something that a nation can produce. If you're a bigger nation, you can produce an atomic bomb and destroy the whole world. If we had a political union of the whole globe, Michio Kaku argues, then a, a, an atomic bomb would not be a threat because one nation would not be in the temptation to drop it on another nation because they, I don't know, are too ginger or something. <laughs> um, so clearly, in some respects, we have, um, we are able to technically produce something that's more advanced than our political or human understanding. Well, again, I'm becoming a little bit hippie here, but, but the, the, the harmony and understanding, sympathy and love abounding that you know, the time of Aquarius is supposed to bring in this, 
in this musical called Hair by the Way, <laughs> made by Czech foreman. So another a little bit of a cultural export, if I may. Um, we're not advanced. So in other words, we're not advanced enough in our coordination for the advances that we have. So one example is this atomic bomb. Another example is banking. So banks have been typically regulated by national states, but today that is hardly a concern for a bank, which is pretty much everywhere. So in order to regulate banking, you need to have European regulation or, in some respect, a worldwide regulation. So the question that Michio Kaku asks is, will we be able to survive the atomic threat or the ecological threat until we are able to coordinate ourselves politically and understand ourselves? So you can also view European integration in, this, in these dynamics. So, um, so that's one, one answer. So I, yes, I do believe in, in, in European Union of the region. So some things should be decided regionally. Other things, only those that cannot be decided regionally, should be decided uh, 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 in, in, in common. So, uh, but there was another, uh, sorry, the other part of your question, if you can repeat that again. So if we have five minutes, I promise I will now focus on answering the question. Only as a short question, short answer that I give to them today. Short question? Yes, yeah, so I was just wondering, are euro bonds a means, for example, to, uh, to get rid of this thinking in uh, national terms and uh, move to a more uh, regional approach? Yes, uh, I think we, 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 we understand this a little bit more that no, no man is an island, that we are very much interconnected. And if something happens in Greece, it's like in personal, I mean, if you have a relationship with somebody, even a personal or a business, relationship, when something happens to that person, you also get hurt. And this, I think, would be a nice way to finish uh, our, our lovely debate, which I enjoy very much. You know, Adam Smith asked himself the question, what is the cause of wealth of nations? And he came with this very famous answer that is basically specialization. But he didn't stress enough one thing that I, I think deserves stressing. If two of us would be exactly the same, there would be nothing that we could trade. If we would agree on everything, there would be no exchange, not only of goods and services, but also of thoughts. So the real wealth of nations happens when two people who are absolutely different start trading. In other words, we find a language, and this is one wonderful thing about economics, so that I don't appear like a critique of economics. Economics is a very much of a magnetic Thing. It makes, it creates a language that we too, you can be Chinese and I can be from Honolulu, but we can trade and we can enrich our lives exactly in this. And I think economics is much more, or could be much more of a glue even than culture, even than religion, because culture very often divides. So does nationalism, so does, uh, so does uh, religion very often. Even though religion wants to unite people, you end up very often with division. Economics is sort of a... Uh, a force which works uh, in the interest of both of us and it seeks for differences and it wants to connect them. Thank you very much.